Could you please explain us what Google VO3 is and why it was made? Google VO3 is a really impressive video generation model that was recently released by, by Google. It involves some features that the previous models didn't have. So it's not just improving a like-for-like -like system. Critically, VO3 also allows for semantically consistent audio generation. What that means is if you generate generate a video, let's say, of eggs frying in a pan, it will create sound effects of the egg sizzling, which are consistent with the video, which was something that previously wasn't really possible, or at least it certainly wasn't easy to do and wasn't easy to do well. Could we say that um, Google VO3 can make content uh, of, about everything? So VO3 won't be able to generate absolutely anything you prompt at, or at least it's certainly meant to stop you being able to do so. Um, the standard procedure for any release of a powerful uh, generative model will involve a significant amount of red teaming that is intentionally trying to make these models generate things that are undesirable, such as graphic content, racist content and the like. Um, and by doing so, they then learn how to basically better secure the model to to make it harder to uh, to generate those kinds of outputs and there will also be a variety of other different kinds of safety testing and what's called alignment processes involved to make sure that these models aren't easily weaponizable having said that there have been some cases which are really tricky around vo3 where it has been misused clearly but typically that misuse has come from what I guess you could call contextual misuse rather than the content in and of itself being inherently um, harmful. Um, so if it's things like uh, gore or um, pornographic content or um, certain kinds of racial terms being involved, um, hate speech and the like, typically it's gonna be good at capturing those. What it struggles a little bit more with though is how, for example, sometimes disinformation or um, I guess unpleasant material, bullying or harassing material can be entirely contextual. It can be particular in a way which is very hard to kind of moderate for. I think that somehow um, VO3 can be a threat for a lot of people and a lot of institutions. So could you tell me who does it threaten or what does it threaten like Google VO3? So we've seen, for example, around some of the conflicts that have been happening recently in places like um, Iran and Israel and Gaza. We've seen people creating um, AI generated videos of warfare, of bombings, of uh, destroyed cities, which again is really hard to moderate for because some of the scenes you might be seeing which are presented as if they are from a real war zone could easily also be part of a film. They could be part of a, a film about war. And indeed, we actually see often video game footage presented as if it was real war footage in disinformation campaigns. So in that respect, it plays into that existing challenge that we already see, but it's certainly something which has become notable. And fact checkers are really starting to struggle with the volume of quite realistic AI generated video content that they're starting to see. I think we're also seeing the impact of uh, forms of some kind of harassment um, around the way that this content is shared, particularly towards certain groups. Um, I've certainly seen some uh, videos which are let's say, um, very um, derogatory towards uh, fat people, putting forward some pretty unpleasant uh, views around uh, minority groups. I've seen videos presented of uh, refugees crossing the English Channel in small boats, making it look like they're invaders, which again is a very hot topic um, and controversial topic here in the UK right now. Um, so there are lots of different ways that the videos that are being generated could be weaponized. But I do want to emphasize that these are videos where a lot of the kind of harm is contextual. Again, it could be the case that someone could generate a video of those refugees crossing the channel as a way to try and create empathy with audiences. Um, you know, it would be seen as erasure to say, well, you can't generate pictures of large people in your, in your footage or, or of different kind of ethnic groups. 
So I think there is still definitely work to be done, no question about it, and it's an ongoing process of understanding how these models can be used and abused. Authors of these VO3 videos earn money, and how do, do they make that? So one of the interesting side effects of VO3 is that it has supercharged a trend we've been seeing over the last 18 months or so, which is the rise of what's called AI slop content. That is low quality clickbait style audiovisual media, which is shared widely on social media, which gets a lot of views and a lot of clicks. For example, the third most viewed video in early July on YouTube was an AI slop video of a baby flying a plane. And it's essentially just low quality, low information content, which is just purely designed to kind of catch your eye um, and get views without there being much substance to it. Now, VO3 has really supercharged this content approach um, and has led to a huge amount of accounts being created on various social media platforms to create and scale this content to try and farm views for monetization and for advertising um, and even sometimes sign up some referrals. And this is something that we've seen have a real financial return for these people and it's something that actually YouTube and Meta have both announced recently that there is going to be a change to their policies around repetitive and inauthentic content to try and mitigate the amount of this content that's succeeding on the platform um, because they understand that it's sort of polluting the information ecosystem drowning out real creators so this again is one of those side effects of not just VO3, but the whole suite of generative AI tools that we're now seeing coming online. Do you have any tips to give to people uh, that look, watch a video like that and be like, mm. oh, like, is this true or not? The release of this model has led to some, I think, growing uh, awareness in the general population of just how good AI generated content now can be. And this has led to a knock on effect of people now increasingly doubting whether content they see is, is AI generated or not, because they know in many cases, the naked eye or indeed ear is no longer reliable. Um, and so what we're starting to see is, is this increasing appetite for transparency and clarity about how a piece of content has been created. There are a couple of ways that can, we, can, we can kind of approach this. I think one, it's important to say Google did think about this before they released the model. And as part of VO3, they introduced into VO3 a technique they developed called Synth ID, which is effectively like a kind of watermarking approach where data that you cannot see is injected into the image or the video being generated, which can then be picked up on as kind of like a good faith red flag to people to say, this has got AI in it, or this is AI generated, which is which is a, a smart approach, I think, um, to have baked into the foundations. Some people are really um, interested in deep fake detection or AI, de uh, AI detection tools. Um, this is a technique we need to be very cautious about because there are many tools out there which are not robust, that is they're not reliable and they're not impervious to being uh, fooled into giving a false positive or a false negative. And if we over rely on these models like people asking Grok is this real, when Grok itself is not a good reliable guide to whether something is real, we could end up over relying on not very reliable technologies. So. There's a space for detection, but it has to be used cautiously and with an understanding of its limitations. The third and final approach that I would touch on here is, is this idea that we can start to use digital nutrition labels, which are attached to images and videos like those from VO3, that provide a breakdown of what's in the video, how it's been created, how it's been generated, or how it's been edited. Now, the initiative that is kind of pushing this forward is called uh, the C2PA, and they've developed a standard which is called Content Credentials, which is advocated for by the Content Authenticity Initiative, which is trying to get more people to adopt these digital nutrition labels to provide more transparent content to people in their daily lives. It's not about saying using AI is bad, right? It's about saying, I'm using AI and I understand that it's important that you know how I've used it. The last thing I'll say here is I think it's it's really important to recognize that there is actually an increasing danger in giving people a sense that they themselves with their naked eyes and ears can spot this content reliably. There's no guarantee that in a week's time that they will still be true 
because new tools and new techniques might have been released. The speed of change and evolution around AI-generated content is incredibly fast. So I think we need to start recognizing that, including myself, our eyes and ears are not reliable guides to whether a piece of content is real or not. In a time like this, it means that traditional forms of investigative journalism done by reliable and, and robust organizations is, is more important than ever. This is the time when we need to be relying on people who have the skill sets to do deep journalism and have the journalistic standards to make sure that their reporting is truthfully and honestly as they can. Doesn't mean they're always gonna get it right, but most of the time it's gonna be done with, with a, a level of rigor and a level of scrutiny, which I think is really important for us to approach content with in this kind of generative age.